No matter where you're joining us from this morning, and no matter what you believe, our invitation is this. Come experience Jesus with us. Good morning, Rock Hill. Will you stand and sing with us? of our God and King, lift up your voice and with the sing, oh I'll praise Him, hallelujah, now burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Awesome. It's so good to see you. And now you're all rested with an extra hour of sleep, so you don't need to take it during my sermon. Awesome. I'm glad we're all on the same page for that. Uh, if you are joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here with us. And uh, did you know that today is International Sunday or International Orphan Sunday? Uh, it's a Sunday where the church just kind of pauses to remember the fatherless 
those who don't have parents. And you're going to hear a number of different ways that we're involved throughout the service, whether in foster care or adoption or international orphan care. And what we see throughout the scriptures is that God closely identifies with the vulnerable, with the fatherless and the widow, and he calls us as his people to care for them like he does. And so I thought it appropriate this morning that as we tune our hearts to worship that I just read from Psalm 68. It says this, sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the clouds to your help. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads the prisoners to prosperity. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for adopting us into your family. God, you have chosen us. You have loved us. And we want the children in our community who are without a loving family to experience your love for them too. Show us today, God, your heart for the fatherless, and clearly show those of us who you want to provide foster care or adoption to a child in need. Help us to know the calling that you've called us to and give us the grace and the boldness to carry it out. Holy Spirit, meet with us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
blessing Tune my heart to sing that grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood that we can look up and see that it's your grace, it's your fount of blessings that has brought us here. And the only right response to that is, here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart, Lord. We praise you for the fount of all blessings, the streams of mercy. We praise you, Lord. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. In the ancient world, there were children on the hills. Children who could not be cared for by their families, whether because of financial burden, sickness, or disability, or simply because she was a girl at a time when girls were not valued. Families had the option 
of taking their child to the hills. And when they got to the hillside, they would lay their child on the ground and walk away, knowing and intending that within minutes, hours, or days, this child would be a victim of the elements. There were children on the hills. This was not a rarity. This was not a scandal. In the ancient world, this was common, accepted, and expected. And then came Jesus. The church began sending search parties to head for the hills. These search parties would sweep through the hillside, looking for children who had been left behind. When they found one, they would bring them home and adopt them into their new family. States, there are 400,000 kids in the foster care system. One in four cannot go home. That means there are 100,000 kids on the hillside. 100,000 kids are waiting for someone to come for them. 100,000 kids are waiting for a search party. We are that search party. It's time again. A movement is rising. There are children on the hills. Head for the hills. Good morning. My name is Anne Marie, and I am with the Real Hope Project. Um, every time I see that video, most times I forget to even introduce myself because it gets me emotional. Because my daughter Ayla Jean, the one on the far right there, the blonde, she was one of those kids. At the end of her freshman year in high school, her father died of a heart attack right in front of her. Her mom was an addict, and because of no fault of her own, she ended up in the foster care system. Halfway through her junior year of high school, she moved into our home. We were her sixth foster home. When she moved in, she did not think anyone would ever adopt her. She was trying to figure out what she was going to do when she was a senior, because in September she turned 18, and she would age out of the foster care system. She would have to work, put herself through school, and figure out life on her own. Instead, on December 20th of that year, we adopted her. <laughs> two months after she turned, uh, two, three months after she turned 18. And a lot of times we get asked the question, why did you adopt her when she was 18 years old? And I look at people and say, well, when was the last time you called your mom or your dad? When was the last time you wanted to go home? No matter where you move or wherever you go, there's always a place you call home. How many times do you need advice in life, even as an adult? Just because you're 18 and you're classified as a legal adult doesn't mean you have a clue what's going on in life. I still don't have a clue. I call my mom all the time. 
AJ moved into our home and filled a void that we did not even know existed. Now she's a senior in Mankato. She's been on the presidents and deans list every semester that she has been in college. And she also speaks for the Real Hope Project and advocates for adoption out of foster care. Without adoption, AJ would have become a statistic. 80% of the people involved in our prison systems and in sex, involved in sex trafficking have one thing in common. They were once in our foster care systems. If you age out of the foster care system in the United States, 20% of those kids are instantly homeless. Every year in the United States, we have 20,000 kids who age out of the foster care system. Two thirds of the women who age out of foster care will have a child by the age of 21. And guess what happens to two thirds of their children? They end up right back in the foster care system. Church, if we want to change the world and we want to affect the problems that we have in our world, helping these kids is the way we do it. In the state of Minnesota, we have 10,000 kids in our foster care system, and 1,000 of them will never go home to their families. They are in need of forever families. Right now, I want to introduce you to one of those kids. Some things I like to do for fun are reading, I like to draw, I like to build out of Legos, I like to hang out with my friends. What's so cool about Legos is the infinite possibility of building and knowing that there is no limit to whatever you want to build. What do you think of heights? Heights don't really scare me much. One thing I want to try someday would probably be like skydiving. be really, really good at one thing, it'd probably have to be art, like drawing and sketching and stuff like that. Yeah, like when I grow up, I really want to be an artist. Friends for me are important because, you know, sometimes just need someone there to help support me and hang out with and, you know, laugh with sometimes. My friends would probably describe me as smart, caring, Funny. Something that makes a good friend just being there for each other and accepting who they are. What comes to mind for me when I think of adoption is I think of a family willing to share their home and share their life to care for someone. When I think of family, I picture anybody who's willing to care and really support someone in a way that they build that relationship of family. One problem in the world that I wish I could solve would probably be people's view on like their futures because a lot of people doesn't don't have like their perfect view of the future. So I'd probably want to like help people imagine that and help them pursue it. When I got to the top of the tower it was I guess the first thing I thought was that the view was amazing. My name is Walker and I'm 15 and this is my reel. Since 2016, the Real Hope Project has been going around the state of Minnesota, taking files that listed kids' traumas and all of their diagnoses and photos and turning that into, take, instead of taking that and handing that to families, we've been making these profile videos that show their fun, amazing, quirky personalities. And it has been working. My numbers are out of date. They're out of date every week. But we've made over 210 reels in that five-year period of time 
We've helped over, that represents over 250 kids because sometimes they're sibling groups. We've helped 700 families get involved with foster care, adoption, respite care, things like that. And over half of our kids have been matched with Forever Families. That's pretty amazing. Before we started in Real Hope, nationwide, a teenager had a 3% chance of adoption. In the state of Minnesota, now I cannot claim that Real Hope has made this difference. There's no statistic proving it. But the only significant thing that has happened in the five years is the Real Hope Project making these videos. And now in the state of Minnesota, if you are a teenager, you have almost a 10% chance of adoption. That is pretty amazing to take that statistic and double a kid's chances of adoption. We have an ask for you. And in this church, I think pulling out your cell phone is pretty common, right? Because the QR code's all over the place. If you would pull out your cell phone and open up a text message for me and put in the phone number that you see there, 833-756-7000. And then I'm going to tell you about three things that you can get involved with. Adoption, upstream, or giving. Adoption is obvious. That is adopting a child out of foster care. If there's anything in you that goes, maybe I might one day, just put that word in there. And our staff will send you some information. Nobody bugs you. You're not signing up on the dotted line for a child. We're not going to ship one to you. You know, just, uh, <laughs> just put that word in there and find out information. That also can involve getting involved with foster care or respite care, which is being the pseudo auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa to a child who is in foster care or who has been adopted. Upstream. Now, you guys, when Casey has been here before, might have heard of this called Village. Village was the idea of having people come around adoptive and foster families and helping support them. We've changed this to Upstream because we've expanded that view. Village still falls under Upstream, but Upstream is going against the grain. So we work with adoption on this end of the spectrum. Swimming Upstream is trying to help families before their kids get involved with foster care. We work with organizations like Together for Good and Safe Homes, and we help make videos for them as well and tell the success stories that have helped families in crisis so their children don't get into fo foster care. And it also is supporting grandmas and grandpas who are now taking care of their grandchildren or foster and adoptive family, and giving. We do this totally for free to any child in Minnesota, and now we expand it into Wyoming in October. So Real Hope is expanding. Our dream is to one day be in every single state. Uh, so we offer it for free. It doesn't cost anybody anything, and that's because of the generous people like you that help us make it happen. Thank you so much for your time. If you have questions, my husband and I will be in the back. Well, 10%, let's, uh, let's do better, huh? Uh, why don't you take just a couple minutes now and, and greet someone around you. There's coffee in the back, and then uh, I'll call you back. We'll be in Esther chapter 5 today.
All right, if you want to find your way back to your seats. We got a lot of things going on. I'm going to just start praying, and then you guys will get back to your seats. I got three chapters to cover, and we got more stuff to get to, so let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have now to continue in the story of Esther. God, it is so clear to see your hand at work behind the scenes in these three chapters, and so I pray that not only would we see your hand, but we would see your heart to keep your promises and preserve your people, to oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. And so God, as we read this story, would you fill us with faith, and would you cultivate in us humility that you might raise us up? We ask in Jesus' name, amen. When you hear about foster care and all of the different things of the world, it's so quickly we find just us going, what a mess. This world is not the way that it should be. You and I are not the way that we should be. As we look at the last couple years, in many ways, we've been like, what a mess. God, where are you? And often God's hand is hidden behind the mess, but he's still there. And if we learn anything about God from the story of Esther, is that often when he's hidden, he's working the most in ways that are undeniably him. God is never mentioned once in Esther, and yet there's no way that you can make sense of the story apart from him. Chapters 5 to 7 in this book are some of the most compelling storytelling that we find in all of the scriptures. It weaves together a story that grabs our attention and it just doesn't let us go. The author cleverly tells the the tale in such a way where all of these seeming coincidences just work out. But, of course, if you know the rest of the scriptures, you know that these coincidences are nothing less than the providential hand of God guiding the process and fulfilling his promises and answering the prayers of his people for deliverance. See, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Esther, where where everything turns, illustrate for us this biblical principle that we find all throughout the scriptures. It's this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We find this all throughout the scriptures, but first of all, in Proverbs chapter 3, and then quoted again in the New Testament in James 4 and in 1 Peter 5. Jesus himself, in his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, begins with these words, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who acknowledge their spiritual poverty, who understand their own spiritual bankruptcy. It is them who possess the kingdom of God. It is them who understand the rule and the reign of God most clearly. Not those who perceive that they have it all together, but those who see their spiritual poverty that actually know God. The characters of Esther and Mordecai and Haman are going to live out this principle for us in real time, allowing us to see that this is not just ethereal biblical wisdom, but this actually guides human history, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, this might happen in in God actually bringing down his judgment like he did at the Tower of Babel when the people uh, wanted to make a name for themselves. Or sometimes this happens, often this happens in far more subtle ways through seeming coincidence and happenstance where God takes the proud and brings them low, and he takes the low and he brings them up. We're going to read Esther 5, 6, and 7 this morning, but before we do, let me just catch you up on the story in case you've missed it. Esther, the Jew, has risen to a place of prominence where she is now the queen of Persia. After she rises up as queen, a guy by the name of Haman, the villain in the story, an Agagite who hates the Jewish people and hates in particular a a Jew named Mordecai, who is Esther's adopted father, rises into prominence and becomes the second most powerful man in the Persian Empire. And he comes up with a plan to completely annihilate the entire Jewish race on the 13th day of the 12th month of the 12th reign, or 12th year of the reign of King Ahasuerus. If you're, anything, if you're familiar about numbers at all, there are how many tribes in Israel? Twelve. 
In, in the Bible, 12 is a number of completeness, so he's going to completely annihilate the 12 tribes of Israel on the 12th day of the 12th month, or the 12th month of the 12th year. Queen Esther, provoked by Mordecai, resolves in her mind that she is going to risk her life and she is going to see the king and she's going to intercede on behalf of her people. This is risking her life because in the Persian Empire to go into the king's chambers unsummoned, if he did not receive you, would be an instant death sentence. But she resolves to go and she comes to the conclusion based on the promises of God, based on where she is, and thinking maybe God raised me up for such a time as this. She comes to the, to the faith-filled conclusion, the settled reality, if I perish, I perish, but I go down with Yahweh. I go down with God and with his people. And so she settles in her mind, but, but first she fasts. She and her handmaidens and all of the Jews in the, in the capital city of, of Susa fast and pray for three days. And now, in chapter 5, it picks up with her going into the, to the chamber of the king. Let's read. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it pleases the king, or if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request is, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So Esther risks it all. She approaches the king uninvited. She goes to the throne room and waits. I mean, the tension in that room must have been palpable, right? What is she doing? Does she have any idea that if he doesn't receive her, she's dead? Oh, Esther was very aware of the decision that she was making, and you you can kind of cut the tension in that room with a knife, right? But then when the king sees her, instantly his heart softens. He holds out the golden scepter, which was his way of saying, come. He he beckons her to come, that it's safe, and and she touches the tip of the scepter, and letting Esther know she's free to approach and, and ask whatever it is that's on her mind. Now, King Ahasuerus, as dense as he is, and we've seen that he's dense in this story, right? Knows what Esther has risked in order to come to him unbidden like this. And so he wants to know what's going on. What is it, Esther? What is your wish? It shall be granted to you, even up to half of my kingdom. Now, what strikes you when you read the story? What question do you have in that moment? Esther, why didn't you just ask, right? Or, or again at the feast later on that night. Esther, why didn't you just ask him in that moment to, to save your life and to save the life of the people? Why the elaborate banquet and then the second banquet? Well, we're not told. But what I can tell you is that the king's offer is probably not a real offer. In fact, it was probably more of an elaborate boast by the king meant to draw attention to what he was able to provide if he so chose. The Greek historian Herodotus mentions that King Xerxes, or King Ahasuerus, makes this offer multiple times to many people within his reign. You want to know why it probably wasn't a real offer? Imagine if she would have asked for half the kingdom. How do you think that would have gone? Uh, she, She probably wouldn't be around long enough to see it, right? Even Haman, who is ridiculous in his ambitions, doesn't think to ask for half of the kingdom, right? And so she invites the king to a banquet that she's prepared for him and says, hey, bring Haman along as well. The king's excited about this, and as they're drinking at the banquet, again, the king in high spirits makes the same offer. Esther, what do you want from me? Up to half of my kingdom. And instead of revealing anything yet, Esther says, I want you to come back. If you think this party was great, the party tomorrow is going to even be better. And I want you to bring 
Haman, and at the party tomorrow, at the banquet tomorrow, then I'll make my request. I'll ask you what it is I've been doing here, why I risked so much. But before the banquet happens the next night, we're going to see a long, elaborate series of coincidences happen. Happen in such a way where it's undeniable the providential hand of God behind it all. Let's read verse 9. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotion with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above all of the officials and the servants of the king. That sounds like a great party, doesn't it? The me monster comes out in Haman. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come to the king with, or come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow I'm also invited her Invited by her together with the king. Yet all of this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. So Haman, upon leaving the banquet, is flying high, well into his wine. He had a lot to drink, and he's feeling pretty good about himself on the way home. Until, that is, he sees Mordecai. And whereas everybody else around Haman trembles and bows near or stands in order to respect him, Mordecai seems very unmoved by Haman. He doesn't even rise in honor to greet him, but ignores him. This, even after the party, even after a great mood, sends Haman into a quiet rage. But in that moment, he restrains his anger. He bides his time. He believes that revenge is a dish best served cool rather than hot. That he's going to get the last laugh as he wipes out Mordecai and as he wipes out all of the people of Mordecai. And so Haman gets home obviously still upset, and he sends for his friends and his wives, and it's here that his true colors come out. The party turns pretty quick into a brag fest. Haman, like many men with fragile egos, brags about all that he has, his riches, his sons, his promotions, his advancement beyond everybody else, even his special little banquet with King Ahasuerus and Queen Esther, where he was the only one invited. You ever been around someone like Haman before? At a dinner party or at a work meeting? Uh, Brian Regan, the comedian, calls this person the me monster who's always trying to one-up the person. It's awful, isn't it? See, hidden behind this, this veneer of arrogance and, is a scared little boy crying out for validation and vindication. Someone who needs everyone else to validate him and tell him how great he is. That it's not enough to be as advanced as he is, to be as rich as he is, to have as much as he has. He needs others to be jealous of what he has and tell him how awesome he is. He has it all, and yet as we saw back in chapter 3, it isn't enough for him. Power and riches are never enough to actually give us a name worth anything. And so after getting through his list of accomplishments, he suddenly moves from the hero in the story to the tragic victim. Don't we all feel bad for him? Even though I have it all, it's not worth it to me as long as Mordecai is alive. (laughs) The food has no taste. The wine has no riches. As long as Mordecai lives... The one man who won't acknowledge how awesome I am, Mordecai the Jew. And here his friends and his wife reveal themselves to be not friends at all, but but cowering hanger-ons. We have an idea. Why don't you build a gallows 75 feet high? That's what 50 cubits is in our measurements. 
And when the, when the Bible translates it gallows, they didn't actually hang people, but rather it was a large stake in which they would impale people because that's what Persians did to their enemies in order to strike fear and terror into those so that they wouldn't cross them again. So Mordecai has a 75-foot-high stake built that he is going to impale Mordecai on In the morning, and his wife says, You go and tell the king, which tells us something about how Haman views himself. Because who orders who around? The king orders people around. But Haman is in such a position of prominence and power, and he's already had his way with the king that she says, You tell him what to do. You tell him to kill Mordecai and hang him on the gallows. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 tells us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. How do you think it's going to end for Haman? Yeah, not so good. See, meanwhile, back at the palace, God is working subtly to oppose the proud, but give grace to the humble. Verse 1 of chapter 6. On that night, the king could not sleep, and he gave orders to bring the book of memorable deeds, the chronicles, and they were to be read before the king. So all of you guys who hated history class, this is your justification right here. Haman needs to fall asleep. Bring the history book. Read it aloud. It'll be no time. Some of you guys maybe put on a podcast of my sermons. If you can't fall asleep, you're like, does it every time. I joke. Wait, do you really do that? No, I'm just kidding. And it was found written how Mordecai had told about Big Thana and Tiresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold and who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, what honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? The king's young men who attended him said, nothing's been done for him. Now, what are the chances that not only could the king not sleep, but he just so happened to pick up the book and read the exact section in the book that spoke of Mordecai not actually being rewarded for saving his life? Almost zero, right? This is clear that God is doing something behind the scenes. Not only that, but in the morning as he's contemplating, what can I do to honor Mordecai? Guess who just so happens to be strolling into the palace to ask for Mordecai's death? Haman, who could not wait to a decent hour, is coming in to ask for the, for the life of Mordecai that he might hang him on the gallows in the exact moment that King Ahasuerus is thinking, how can I honor this guy? Uh, it's delicious, isn't it? <laughs> Verse 4, and the king said, who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. And the, young king's, or the king's young men told him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor? And I love, this is one of my favorite verses. And Haman said to himself, Who would the king delight to honor more than me? And Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and the horse that the king has ridden, and on on whose head a royal crown is set. And let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials, Let them dress the man whom the king delights to honor. Let one of the nobles take on the posture of a servant and dress this person. And let them lead them on the horse through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to Mordecai the Jew. (laughs) Oh, to be a fly on the wall in that moment, right? We're all like, yeah. (sighs) Who sits at the king's gate, leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and he dressed Mordecai and led him through the square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. But probably with a little more gusto, I would have loved to see that little victory parade around the streets. 
watching Haman have to walk the capital city, shouting at the top of his lungs for everyone to honor the very man that he hates and wanted dead. Verse 12, then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. While they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Haman's wife, Zeresh, is an interesting character in the story, isn't she? she? She not only comes up with the idea to build the gallows, but now she sees where this obsession in her husband is heading. Haman doesn't see it yet, but she does. In fact, she says, if Mordecai is a Jew, you're going down. Seemingly a prophetic insight, isn't it? And yet to, meant, meant to draw our attention not only to Mordecai the Jew, but to the promises that God made to the Jewish people. But at at that very moment, as they are contemplating these things, coincidence, the king's attendants, the eunuchs come and they whisk him off to to the banquet feast that he was looking forward to. The banquet feast that, remember, he was supposed to go to in peace because Mordecai would have been dead by now. And this is what happens. Chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to the feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Esther, Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. And everybody's like, Yeah! Yeah! Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen, and the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence? In my own house? As the words left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the, of the, on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose, whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Now you couldn't have timed this stuff any better if you had planned it all out. And there was one who did. Esther finally reveals to the king what caused her to take such a risk in the first place. The king, who's already well into his wine at this point, rages when he hears about Haman and this plot to kill not just the Jews, but his very queen. And so he has to take a walk in the palace garden to compose himself, which gives Haman just the brief glimmer of hope that he he thinks he needs. He knows the king. He knows he's not getting any mercy from him. And so he begins to throw himself at the feet of Esther, begging for mercy, begging for his life. And he, he comes and he falls down on the couch, most likely bowing before her, suing for mercy. And the king in his rage comes back exactly at that moment where he's throwing himself on the couch and he misreads the scene. He thinks that Haman, in his insolence, is trying to assault his queen in his house. And at this moment, there is no return for Haman, is there? He is done for. It's as if the king finally sobers up and realizes that he's been played by Haman for many, many months. 
he orders that Haman's head be covered, which was common for prisoners in the Persian Empire. And just at that moment, one of the palace eunuchs, Harmona, see, I have a feeling Haman didn't have many friends, (laughs) says, oh, by the way, funny that you mentioned this. There's a gallows that was prepared for Mordecai, the guy who actually saved your life, at Haman's house. It was prepared for him, but just sitting there. Just thought I'd throw that in. And Haman ends up impaled on the very spike that he had constructed for Mordecai. Have you ever heard the term poetic justice? I can't think of a story where it's more satisfying than this one, right? Hang Haman on that. Now here's the brilliance of the storytelling. All throughout the story, you see not only proud and humble people, but there's a lot of up and down imagery, especially if you look closely at the language. Haman builds this ludicrously tall stake in which he is to impale Mordecai because Mordecai won't get low or bow in his presence. In the twist in chapter 6, Mordecai is placed high on the horse and Haman has told by his wife that you have begun to fall before him. Then as we look at verse 8 in chapter 7, as the king returns from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling or getting low on the couch where Esther was. And finally, we end with Haman being exactly where he wanted to be, higher than anyone else, (laughs) albeit impaled on a stake and dead. Now, the story of Esther doesn't end here. We still have the drama of what's going to happen to all of the Jews throughout the Persian Empire, but in so many ways, the tension of the story ends and is resolved here. Haman, the great enemy of the Jews, is exposed, is judged and killed on the very gallows that he has prepared for Mordecai. See, we learn very clearly in this story, as entertaining as it is, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If ever a story illustrated a point, it is this one. God actively works against those who promote themselves, who hunger after power and control and revenge and selfish ambition, meaning... If you want the God of the universe, the one who spoke Lake Superior into being and the stars into being, to actively work against you, spoiler, you're going to lose that, be proud. Push yourself forward. Think that you are far greater than you are, and the God of the universe will oppose you, and you will be humbled. But on the flip side, God works on behalf of those who humble themselves. In contrast to Haman, we see Esther and Mordecai humble themselves. They fast and pray in preparation. Mordecai mourns and grieves. And they rely not on their own cunning and wits, but rather on their God. Esther approaches the king not with swagger and pomp like Haman does, but humbly, her very life in the scales. She comes at the tail end of not eating or drinking anything for three days, which is going to affect your condition. She asks the king not for what would put herself forward or or what would benefit her, but rather asks for the life of her people. Brothers and sisters, in God's kingdom, the way up is down. The way toward greatness is to become a servant. The way to exaltation is through humiliation. It is this way, and because this is exactly what our Savior did, didn't he? See, we read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, a great hymn of the early church. The Apostle Paul tells the church, you need to be like Jesus and have the same attitude as him. This is how it reads. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, something to grasp, something to leverage for his own purposes and plans. Verse 7, instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, that's a big therefore, isn't it? 
That in light of him humbling himself, therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So why does God exalt his son, Jesus? Because even though it was within his rights and privileges, he laid those things down in order to serve even to the point of death. Not just risking his life like Esther, but laying down his life for his people. Therefore, he is exalted to the highest place and given the name above all names. In the same way for you and I, in the kingdom of God, in the rule and the reign of God, the way up is down. The way to greatness is through serving. The the way to being somebody is to think of yourself as a nobody. Now, we may not be threatened with genocide or extinction as a people, but every day we face the choice to either humble ourselves and serve or elevate ourselves by taking the position of prominence and demanding that others serve us. Most of you guys are thinking, Pastor Kyle, I'm nothing like Haman. I have no genocidal fantasies. I don't spend my dinner parties listing out all of my accomplishments, begging people for a whole round of attaboys. Well, that's good, right? I'm glad, but do you know that pride is at the root of every sin that you commit and every sin that I commit? See, Adam, in the garden, way back at the beginning, sinned because he didn't think that submitting to God's law was the best thing for him. He was tired of being under his rule and reign and thought that he could do a much better job of running his life. And how many times do you and I feel the exact same way? We read something in God's command or God's law and we think, I don't know if I really want to do that. I don't know if God really knows what he's talking about when he commands me like that. I might do a better job determining right and wrong for myself, in fact, being my own God. Guys, that is the spirit of our age, is it not? To be true to ourselves? To do whatever feels right to us? It's the exact sin that Adam committed. That's the exact thing that Haman thinks. I can run the show better. See, pride is at the root of all of our sin. But if pride is the chief sin of man, then the opposite, I think, is also true. All true virtue begins with humility a right view of ourselves in light of God, an awareness that we are not God and that God is God and that that's good news. And that's a good thing. It begins with a joyful awareness and submission to the rule and the reign of God as his creatures created for him. This even gets at the heart of all true salvation, doesn't it? Remember how Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, what keeps many people from coming to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is not the grossness of their sin, but rather the perception of their own righteousness or self-righteousness. They believe in their heart of hearts that they don't need a Savior, that they're pretty darn good on their own. I can't tell you how many people ultimately don't respond to Jesus' gracious offer of salvation and forgiveness because they don't actually think they need it. I'm not that bad. At least I'm not like Hitler or Haman. At least I'm not a pedophile. Really? Is that the standard you think God holds us to? Is all that God requires of us not to be a genocidal maniac like Hitler or Haman or abuse kids? I think we all know that his standard is a little higher than that, isn't it? We hope so anyway. See, we don't need to guess what his standard is for us. He tells us. His standard is perfect righteousness. In fact, if we break one of the commandments, we are guilty of being lawbreakers. How many people do you need to murder in order to be a murderer? This is not a trick question. Just one. Now, how many lies do you need to tell in order to be a liar? Just one. And we could go through the list of the Ten Commandments and probably find it unbelievably damning. See, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us this. For the wages of sin is death. 
That's what our performance has earned us. That's the wages that we deserve. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We deserve death and judgment, but are offered Christ as a free gift of eternal life in him, by faith in him. What do we need to do to receive that? We humble ourselves and we acknowledge our need, don't we? We see ourselves rightly in light of who God is and in light of what God's standards are, and we throw ourselves on his mercy. We bring ourselves low. We acknowledge our poverty of spirit. And God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, doesn't he? Will you respond to his gracious invitation today? Will you trust him? Will you see your poverty of spirit perhaps as the first step in a long line of step to see yourselves more rightly that you might be one that God gives grace to rather than opposes? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I want to close with a simple but profound question, just one of them. How can you begin to root out pride in your life and cultivate humility instead? How can you actively root out pride and all of its tentacles in your life? And how can you begin cultivating humility, bringing yourself low that he might raise you up? I want to share with you a chart that I've shared over the years. And so if you've been here for a while, you've seen this before. You're welcome. It's always good to revisit something good. For some of you, you've never seen this before. This has been incredibly helpful in my life to root out pride and to cultivate humility. And guess what? I still need it. Still working on that. Still don't see myself rightly. See, at some point in time, uh, we become aware of a gap that exists between God's righteous and holy standards and our performance. Our awareness of God's righteousness and Hits a, hits a moment where we're also aware of our own sinfulness. And we realize there's nothing that we can do to fill that gap other than to look to Jesus to save us. And in that moment, we look to the cross and God welcomes us into his family. He adopts us into his family, as it were. And the way that we grow in godliness from this point forward is not simply by saying, okay, I'm in the door, now I gotta work really hard. Now that I'm here, i got to prove my worth in the family of God. Can you imagine a kid living like that, how miserable it would be? No, actually, the way that we grow is often we realize that, that our understanding of salvation at the moment of conversion is often really, really small. The more that we learn about God and his holiness and his standards, the more we realize we thought God's standard was here, it's actually up here. We fall so much farther shorter. Short of it. Not only that, but simultaneously we realize I'm way worse than I have thought. Sin isn't just the bad things that I do or the sinful things that I say. It's actually also the, the motives of my heart, even when I do good things. The thoughts that I think that fill me with a sense of defilement and I realize I'm way worse than I ever imagined. And guess what? The gap between the two widens. But in that moment where I realize I'm far worse than I ever dared imagine, I look to Jesus and I realize that he's a far more wonderful savior than I ever dared hope. And in that moment, I see that the cross and all that Jesus has done has gotten bigger. It's gotten bigger. Not that Jesus' work has changed, it's just that my perception of it has changed. One of my favorite uh, allusions in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia is when Lucy comes to Aslan and she says, Aslan, you're bigger. He's like, yep. Every year that you grow, I get bigger to you. She's like, so you're not actually growing? He's like, no, but your perception of me grows. In the same way as we walk with God in, in fellowship and in communion with him, our understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done grows and grows and grows, and it leads us to worship. It, it helps us to cultivate humility in our heart. As we look at other people, we realize, I'm not any better. As we hear the devastating stories of these kids in foster care, and we think, oh my goodness, how much grace have I been given? I still know my mom and dad. Look at all the things that they've given to me that I, I couldn't earn for a second. I didn't contribute to one minutia. It humbles me, doesn't it? Not that I feel bad about that, but that I long for everybody else to experience what I had. And even with all of that, I still screwed up. I still fell short of God's standards. 
And Jesus is a more wonderful Savior than I ever dared hope. See, it leads me to worship and humility and all that is good. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so Christian, will you cultivate humility in your life? This might be just one thing that might help along the way. Those who are here this morning that maybe have never put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, maybe today for the first time you became aware of the gap that exists between God's standard and your performance. My invitation, my charge to you would be to humble yourself today and receive God's free gift of mercy. Acknowledge your sin and put your trust in him. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and for how even this story in the Old Testament that weaves together this clever narrative shows us about these spiritual realities that are so vital for us to understand today. God, help us to humble ourselves that you might lift us up. Help us to choose joyfully the path of the servant, realizing that that is the way that we might truly live. God, fill our hearts with worship in this moment, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing? During this song, uh, we'll also be receiving tithes and offerings. There's an opportunity if you want to give online or as it comes by. But would you sing with us? There is no other So sure and steady My hope is held in your hand When castles crumble And breath is fleeting Upon this rock I will stand Upon this rock I will stand Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring, we crown him Lord of all. Kindly rule has shattered and broken the curse of sin's tyranny. My life is hidden beneath heaven's shadow. Your crimson flood covers me. Oh, your crimson flood covers me.
but Jesus, Lord of all. We raise the anthem, our loudest praises ring. We crown him Lord of all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat real quick. I want to call Deb and uh, Liz up here. Uh, Deb works on a board called Orphan's Joy, and Deb and Liz are going to be traveling this week to Belize uh, to be a support to an orphanage down there. And Laura, I'm going to actually just have you come up and pray over them as we commission them and send them. So Laura is our global deacon, and we just wanted to pray for them as they go. Lord, we are so very thankful for the opportunity that these ladies have, and we send them with great joy. Lord, I pray that you would go before them just like you went before Esther and Mordecai, Lord, would you be working out all of these details for their great joy and praise to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you guys want to find out a little bit more about Orphan's Joy and what they're doing, they've got a little table set up in the back next to the Real Hope people, so there's lots of great stuff. Also, if you want to give to Operation Christmas Child, there's lots of things you can do for orphans and kids in the back, so thank you guys for being here. Um, guess what? I'm not doing announcements today. Josh is, but he's in Florida, so. Hey everybody, my name is Josh. I'm the youth director at Rock Hill. Me and my wife, we are in Florida this weekend at the Youth Pastor and Wives Retreat. Um, but I had something I was really excited about. I wanted to do the announcement today and let you know about it. So first off, today is Pizza with the Pastors. So right after the second service, you can go across the street um, to our church office building over there, and we have pizza with the pastors. So we have pizza with the pastors once a month, and what that is is if you are new to Rock Hill or you um, are wanting to connect, dive in, and learn more of what our church is about, you can go to Pizza with the Pastors, sit down with a pastor, and ask whatever questions you have. So that's going to be after the second service, right across the street. You can tell Pastor Kyle if you're going, or you can email Paul at rockhillcc.org. So as some of you might know, so here's the announcement I'm really excited about. I love pizza, but this is great too. Um, as some of you might know, um, we recently opened up a youth center over in Superior. We did a big campaign. It was incredible. And this Wednesday, we are launching our after-school program. So the building is going to be open Monday, Wednesday, Friday to middle school and high school students from all over the area. And basically, it's going to be a place for them to come, a safe place. We have over 10 mentors and tutors that are going to be there to help with homework, um, to provi provide a safe place for these students, um, and just having caring adults. Um, that are there for them. So it's going to be incredible and the big kickoff is this Wednesday and we're encouraging students to come after school and stay for youth group. We're going to have a meal in between there. So come um, to the after school program, meal, stay for youth group. We're just excited to get together and celebrate this launch. Also, if maybe you're an adult and you donated or you have students in youth group or you just heard all about this building, this is also a time where I would love for you to come. We're gonna have some snacks and stuff like that. But during that time, 3 to 5.30, you can come and check out the building as the renovations are done and you can just see what we have going on there in Superior. Now, you guys can stand up and you are now not dismissed, but you are sent out to declare the gospel, to display the gospel, and to delight in the gospel of Jesus. Thank you. I'm going back to the beach. Bye.